Well, for one thing, is that it's actually not my music because it's、uh, a combination of different experiences and different cultures and different composers that involves the music that, that we play together, or that I'm playing when I'm playing alone. I played this rhythm. It was so familiar to me because it, I could relate it to all the blues players that I had heard, like T-Bone Walker, B.B. King, John Lee Hooker. It's like the sound of the railroad train. Womp womp, railroad train. Going clicky clack, clicky clacky down the line. Small, small town, right next to the railroad tracks. There comes the railroad train, going clicky clacky down the line. Don't stop. It's a fantastic instrument because I really get joy out of playing the instrument in the street. Because you meet a lot of people, and I've played it in Bombay and Japan. And in New York and Harlem and Watts and I mean in all the travels we, I, and it's good for people to see an instrument that's made by hand. Always the first reaction is, oh, this is something primitive. But then when、uh, the black people that I've met have heard the instrument, they can relate to it and they start singing and start dancing. And another good thing is that it has a certain kind of concentration that you have in playing the instrument that you have to really. Concentrate. It's like a mandala, and you reach for the center of it. For instance, like here's a rhythm that I wrote. It says.
because that's a, it's something uh, with the body language in it. Myself, you know, I grew up in in the ghetto in Los Angeles and Watts, and I never knew about seasons. And in the ghetto, you really don't really feel uh, it's not that much nature around. I mean, Los Angeles is just flat. It's dry and it's very smoggy. Because I remember when I was very young, uh, from where I live was like 113th Street, and we could see the mountains. And the first three years I was there, I first came there in 1940 from Oklahoma, because when the land was destroyed with oil and uh, the land was destroyed for crops, a lot of people moved to uh, California. It's like the grapes of wrath around that time, and that was our family in the 40s. And when I first got there, the first three years, you could see the mountains, but then after that, around in uh, 45 on, you couldn't see, it was so much pollution, you couldn't see the mountains anymore. And you more or less couldn't really feel the seasons because of, in the ghetto, it's, it's not that much of a feeling of nature. And this is something that I always had a dream of experiencing when I was young. And I always had this dream of being in nature and I wanted my children to experience that.
when we left Tova, you know, my friend Babaji that stays there, staying there now, and I was uh, very sad, and I said, I really, uh, you know, it was difficult for me to leave because it, uh, it was a very beautiful time of the year. But Babaji said a beautiful thing. He said that we must take all this light and beauty to give to other people because that is compassion. Being here in Long Island City, why did you choose this place? Yeah, I guess more or less it chose us <laughs> because we have a lot of friends that are living here. this bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, to come into the city and you know you didn't have no money to catch the train to get there. It's a long bridge. When you get there, you gotta hustle up to make it, you know, to make that rent. I mean, that's another survival, you know, but you gotta do it. You gotta make it. Some kind of way you wanna make it. And you're trying to keep your integrity and your heart and you don't wanna do nothing wrong, you know. You don't wanna do any bad karma. Back 
be in Timbuktu when? I'll be there June, January the 29th. Plus New Year's, I'll be, I'm a, the first sign I want to see New Year's Day is Kilimanjaro. I want to be right there in Arusha. Yeah. Okay, where are you going now? Why do you go to New York? Well, ever since the first time coming to New York with Ornette Coleman was uh, uh, because we didn't meet in New York. Uh, and Ornette is one of the main reasons of me going to New York because we went there together. And uh, in New York, it's a certain energy and creativity that is uh, it's really kind of hard to explain. But uh, maybe it's because of, uh, you know, I myself, man, I don't believe in, I don't think of competition in music. You know, I don't think of something being better or worse. It's just different. And I think that is kind of thing brings a certain ego that is keeping a lot of development of musicians coming together, you know, because everyone wants to feel that they're doing something different than everyone else is doing and everyone wants to be an innovator and that. And all the innovators that I've known in my life, you know, John Coltrane, Albert Eiler, Ornette, uh, and many others, Eric Dolphy, they all were playing their music and trying to develop in music. It wasn't to try to be an innovator. It so happens they were innovators, but they wasn't intentionally trying to be innovators. And meeting Ornette Coleman coming out of the bebop period was like a whole study, which I could see like even now, I'm still like a disciple of his in music. And he's a, a guru as a teacher. <laughs> He has a system which is called a harmonic system. Before then, we were always improvising from chords. You play the melody, and then you would improvise from the chords of the melody, standards or chords that uh, from different compositions that uh, had come up at the time of the chords of the, the melody, the composition. <clears throat> Playing with Ornette Coleman was uh, where we would play a melody, which was like similar swing uh, as a bebop, but c coming from that and going into other swings, other rhythms. Uh, and then you would improvise to create forms, uh, to make the music transcend. The object was always to make the brilliance, bring the brilliance of the music, which was the happiness and the spirit. So as you would improvise, you would improvise to uh, create melodies, create forms, create harmonies and rhythms in your improvisation. <laughs>
Do the big companies and the industry run the music scene? Yeah, but well, they're running the whole scene. They're running the media. You know, the, the companies have the media. And uh, especially in, uh, in, in America. So to, uh, they want you to do a certain thing their way. And so they take away from your whole uh, inspiration, uh, creative uh, spontaneity. And for me, that's, uh, uh, I can never sell out that way. Have I asked you to do it? Yeah, I mean, I'm in a, a period in my life now where that I have to decide uh, if I'm going to uh, be a productive machine or am I, I going to be a, a human being that uh, wants to create and in tune with nature. But I mean, see, the thing is, being in America is that the survival, and it's like uh, you have to have money, you know, to be able to survive. Allah, Allah, Allah. 
Take a little blue break. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'd like to uh, thank everybody that's here this afternoon. And this afternoon, we're uh, see we're doing a program for the television in Sweden. And the program is about a family that lives in the forest, and this family comes to the city. And this uh, family lives in this little house here in the forest. And then they come over to this other island over here. And it's like the impression of music from living in the forest, and the impression of uh, mu music from being in the city. We're very happy to have James Ulmer Blood playing guitar with us. And we're very also happy to be playing in a place that we know has been struggling and really making it here in the village for quite a few years. And we remember when it started and we're glad because it takes the community to support these things that are happening. And, and we're glad that this community has been trying to support what's happening here at the club at Rashid's place. I leave yeah. Rashi was the drummer that uh, Coltrane was very close to, John Coltrane, and he uh, has uh, incredible talent, and a lot of musicians love playing with Rashi because he plays with a freeness in uh, uh, his rhythms that uh, leaves it open for improvising. He's an improviser. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
He's a very unique musician yeah, as far as um, his approach to the guitar because you can hear the quality of that soul funk and you can hear the quality of uh, contemporary uh, classics in his music. <laughs> I've been in, in New York at times, man, where it was very hard. I mean, really hard, like you know, sleeping on the roof, sleeping here, no place to sleep, no food, no trying to make it plain, play in a place for, just for meals, you know, and things. Different periods like that where it was very hard. After, like, we came to New York with Arnett uh, in 59 and we played for one and a half years and the man made very good club owner where he bought another club from but we were still getting the same pay and um, and we was trying to better our condition as workers it was a time when you had to have uh, police cards to play and uh, if you had been in any trouble or anything they could take your police card away you know and it was very hard times and afterwards it was even harder and even I mean even then I mean you feel like New York has some kind of a conscious conscience I mean, you're going to pay in all these dues. And can't, I mean, there's no place, there was no outlet. And if there was a place where that you would play, it would only last for a little while. <laughs>
children could be raised uh, with the nature and feel the wind and feel the energy of certain physical, uh, you know, work, which is important. And uh, I really want to get more into that. I've been traveling so much that I'm trying to make my life where next year I can be able to just be a whole year there in Togar. Ja. Mamma dör mig så. Ja men hoppa. Man är på man hoppa man är på man hoppa man är på man hoppa. Kommer det? Man är på man hoppa man är på man hoppa man är på man hoppa man är på man hoppa. See, Togak really, it, the first understanding we came here was like for it to be in Tibetan, uh, they call Dharma Datu, which is like free space. And uh, from traveling and having to stay in hotels and having to go to circumstances and conditions where that you can't continue working. We, f we felt that it should be a place where that traveling artists and people can be inspiration for people to come to, to visit, to uh, balance themselves in, in what they want to do in life. <coughs> and, uh, and, and that's what, I mean, the whole essence of what we wanted to have is free space. That's a good thing to say.
it's all in there. Max, who was? Oh, this is You want to be on Swedish fun. television? Come here. Is that for a porno movie? It's not for a porno movie. <laughs> <laughs> the other movies I go for. Oh, yeah? <laughs> What's the occasion? Just from Sweden? Yes. Oh, yeah. I thought you Excuse yeah. me, I didn't know you. How do you do? Yeah. Very good. We have more goods in the bag. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Can I see the, the one with the gold on it, please? Something like this? Uh, yeah. So nice. <gasps> oh, that's really it's a natural, it's, you see, it's a natural silk made in Paris. You see that? It's on both sides made uh, print. Yeah. See that? Very nice. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. For special for Swedish girl. Mm. You don't have to put anything under there. Uh, absolutely not. Just uh, just on, on, on the body, chiffon on the body. You can see through everything, you know? That's be nice. They'd look at for this, that kind of thing. Yeah, on the Swedish. Mm. Living with the tapestries is something that is really fulfilling. It's a certain happiness and a certain light that no matter how down you feel, it can bring you, bring you up. And that's, to me, is a, a good function. The lofts, they also have an effect upon the music. And they uh, mean a lot to the music. It's yeah. possible to play it there. And so yeah, on. I mean, the environment of having that much space, if you're living in a loft and being able to practice when you want to, because generally it was like a building where there was factories and no one was there in the evening, and you could just, uh, you could make as much noise as you could, where that you couldn't in an apartment house or in a hotel room. So it, it gave the musician more of a space feeling where he wasn't closed up. You have to be ready when you're here to be able to produce and have your energies to be uh, uh, creative if, you, if you're in that field, which we are, you know, in, as creative artists. You have to use that energy to be able to survive. Uh, and Togarp is a place where that seriously you can develop in something that you're studying. That's a place in Togarp where that you can get it done. You can do these very little fine things that uh, are important. New York is a place where you produce it. 
you excel it, you give it out. And uh, because in New York it's people, in Tulgarb it's nature. La da la 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 The memory of Harlem to me has always been like the Mittens Playhouse, this jazz club that is always uh, where all the jazz musicians have played. It's closed now. Yeah, right. And uh, it's a place where that you have memories of, uh, even before I came to Harlem, of it being like a monument for where things were happening, nightlife. You know, another monument that's always said was in my mind even before I came here was at the Apollo Theater. And then when I came here in 59, I had a chance to really see those places and see some of the activity, the same way with 52nd Street. 52nd Street and Birdland was really what was happening when I first came as far as jazz to New York. There's a lot of black music today. It's a lot of black music. I'm trying to bring it back to Harlem. I'm trying to bring a renaissance in Harlem. Trying to bring the ultimate of black music back to Harlem. It was a period when they moved a lot of people out of Harlem. And they moved them, uh, and the people themselves, they had to move because the buildings were contaminated. They had too many rats, and it was falling apart because the landlords wouldn't do anything for the buildings. When they move those people out, they move them to the Bronx. And the Bronx now is like the new Harlem. It's the new slums, the new ghetto, the new bad housing. And that word ghetto and slums is not the word, it's bad housing. It's very sad uh, picture to see how all that space is going to waste. You can see now how they would like to make new buildings much higher so that they can cram more people together. Uh, I myself, I don't believe that that kind of living is a healthy way mentally, physically, or spiritually. Living uh, in the so-called modern uh, architecture of buildings. Now and then you go to Harlem, for example with Nana Vasconcelos. What do you want to achieve there? Well, I go there because I have a lot of friends there. And uh, I hope that uh, I can bring some kind of uh, uh, some kind of light or some kind of uh, knowledge from my travels, and I share that with the different uh, people that I'm involved with and the people that I meet. I take the Duzungoni and play in the street, and it's good because they can see something that's been made by hand, and then they can. Uh, uh, the black people in America now are really interested in getting their roots and understanding their roots. And what's so incredible about that is that the children is the ones that started it. When I was young, I lived next to in Watson, where a man made this tower. It was an Italian man in the middle of a black neighborhood making a tower. And he made it out of seashells and out of ceramics and different pieces. And he made this and couldn't ask anyone to help him because he didn't know why he was doing it, but he had to do it. And that's the same kind of energy that has been carrying us on. Like when me and Moki, uh, before we were here working with movement and trying to go from city to city and make happenings and things, we didn't know why we would do it, but that we had to do it. <laughs>
say is that it's not my music. You, know? uh, you run in different circumstances where musicians say, okay, I have my music, you have your music, this is this music, and music, but uh, I mean, everything is so impermanent. How can you cling to something? You know I mean, life itself is, is not permanent.
fodboldspiller jazz, og ikke karneval. Nej, ikke karneval. Du mener rigtig jazz. <laughs>